Okay, folks, the word of God is alive and powerful, and it's sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing you to the dividing asunder of the soul and the spirit and the joints and the marrow and the pudding of the thoughts and intents of the heart. All scripture is God's reading, and it's profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be mature, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Study to show yourself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. And we're going to take just a moment of time to prepare ourselves for the study of God's word through the technique of rebound and Operation Cry. We call this Operation Recovery. So if you need to use Operation Recovery, do so at this point in time. I'll close our prayer time and we'll go right to our study in 1 Corinthians chapter 3. As bowed and eyes closed, you make your own way with the Lord through the confession of your own personal sins. Father, if it's not one thing, it's another. This morning, it's the weather across the United States. We need to realize, Christians need to realize, that you are in control of every circumstance of life. And amazingly, we're in control of revolution. So the question is, how are we going to handle the circumstances of life? I think this morning's message is going to be right smack dab on target. Right on target. Because there's so many circumstances today, Father, in which we as born again Christians are under pressure. And the question is, how do we handle the pressure? Well, again, 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 10 through 15 are going to deal specifically with that issue. How do we handle the circumstances of life? The good, the bad, the indifferent, the horrible, the disastrous, the pleasant, the wonderful. How do we handle those? And the truth of the matter is, whether it's good, bad, right, wrong, or indifferent, no matter what the circumstance, we need to handle them in exactly the same way. So, Father, take this period of time in our country. It's, listen, Father, you know and I know this is an amazing, an amazing time to be alive. Especially as born-again Christians. There's no greater opportunity to be a witness for you than right now. So with that in mind, we're going to turn our attention, Father, to 1 Corinthians 3, 10 through 15. I'm not sure whether we get through this or not, but if we don't, in my own mind, I will say for five minutes, 20 minutes, what's it going to take to finish this section of Scripture within the next day or two? So if we don't finish it today, Father, I will finish it tomorrow. We can't allow this to go, go by. Every second of the day, every, every second that passes is now in the past, and we cannot recover that. Every second in the future demands that we have the truth and make an application of that truth for the people that we're surrounded by, bearing witness that Jesus is sufficient. Your word is sufficient. So with that in mind, Father, let us turn to this magnificent passage of Scripture appropriate for this day in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, the subject again is 1 Corinthians 3, verses 10 through 15. And you know that we were in, in Revelation chapter 20. We finished that and we're prepared to go into chapter 21. When I was led to go off into, uh, really, at, at, the end of, uh, at the end of Revelation 20, we saw God talking to us through the Apostle John on the island of Patmos about what's going to happen at the great white throne judgment. Well, I would imagine, I would imagine that the, uh, that many of us, as we look at the great white throne judgment, we say, oh, we're not going to be there, but boy, what, what a time that's going to be for the people who are there. And I thought, you know, this is a good time to contrast 
the great white throne judgment with a bema seat. So while we've taken a look at what's going to happen at the great white throne, knowing that we won't be there if we're born again Christians, what we need to do is take a strong look at ourselves and find out what it's going to be like for us when we meet Jesus at that Bema seat. So with that in mind, let's go to our document. And you know, the, the, the longer I teach and the more I teach, the more I realize that I'm only a mouthpiece. That's all I am. I'm a mouthpiece. I've been given the gift of pastor teacher, my responsibility to teach the word of God. I've been teaching it now for, well, I'll go back to 19, about 1963. Uh, well, actually back in 1962 when I was saved. I began to teach the Word of God, not having a clue about what it meant, in a Bible study with sailors in the Navy Chapel in Trinidad. I was given the man, I was given the Sunday school book, and I, I wasn't even pronouncing the words right. But it goes all the way back to 1962, and since that period of time, I've grown in my understanding, growing in grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. But one of the things that has plagued me in my own head is how how to communicate and this that's all it is is communication i can't change anybody's life but how to how to communicate in such a way that people know the difference between coming to bible class and taking in the word of god and then living it out in the sphere of the flesh or living it out in the sphere of the spirit and when you realize that there is a transition there, oh, but it looks good on both occasions. Somebody doing the word of God, uh, you know, applying the word of God from the from the sphere of the flesh, and others from the sphere of the spirit. When you take a look at them, you don't, basically you can't tell the difference. But this is not my concern, but it is my concern in the sense that I I pain, I pain. When I look out and I see the multitude of Christians who are going through the motion. So today's uh, today's lesson is going to be fantastic that relates to the living out the word of God from the sphere of the flesh and living it out from the sphere of the spirit. My pain is, as a pastor, is making sure that I communicate clearly so that it's understood. Let's begin in verse 10. Verse 10 is sort of leading up to the uh, the personal aspect of this, where we're looking at your life, looking at my life. But verse 10 is, a, is, is in itself a magnificent passage. Here's what Paul says. He said, according to the grace of God, which was given to me, like a wise master building, I laid a foundation. There is building on it. But each person must be careful how he builds on it. Now, in that verse, there are two sentences. In the first sentence, Paul's talking about himself. So we're taking a look at the life of Paul and say, oh, boy, that's get, get, get my eyes off of me, Lord, and I will get them on somebody else. Well, we're putting our eyes on Paul, and basically we're putting our eyes on every pastor teacher. Because Paul says, according to the grace of God, which is given to me, like a wise master builder, he said, I laid a foundation. Then he takes a look at somebody else. In other words, he takes his eyes off himself and posts his eyes on someone else at this point in time, not you or me, but on someone else. And he said, I laid the foundation and another is building on it. Then he says, taking a look at himself as a wise master builder and somebody else who's building on his foundation, he said, okay, now let's take a look at you. Let's take a look at me. So now he's talking to the people at Corinth. And he's talking to you and me. At this point in time, I'm a pastor teacher, so he's talking to you. I take this into consideration also. But Paul's talking to you. He said, but each person must be how he builds on it. Well, what's he talking about? Let's take a look at that. 
He said, according to, that phrase according to indicates that there is a standard by which you and I are going to measure ourselves. Basically, what we're doing is we're going to be measuring our salvation. What did it take for you to be saved? And this is, this is one of these areas where as a I pain when I look out the window, when I look out the door, when I walk in, when I walk into the supermarket, when I walk into the library, when I walk into the gas station, when I walk into wherever, and I see the multitudes of people that are out there that call themselves Christians. They go by my window. We have people up and down this street that are going to that are going to uh, assemble themselves in what we call the church. That's church number three. That's the body of Christ. They're going to assemble themselves, and you know from having talked with them that their their means of salvation does not match the word of God. Doesn't match his plan. Then there's only one God who's going to tell us that for sure. So when you look out and you see, Father, how can I witness to these people? Open the door where I can communicate without just dropping a bomb on them. What is the what is the what's the way to do this, Father? Because you know that if they don't get it right, they will be at last week's, last Wednesday's message, not in Sunday morning's message. That's tragic when it's so easy to become born again believer. And by the way, if you're online with me this morning and you're not certain about your salvation, or how about this? You know what you think was the means by your salvation of, that you were saved. But if it if it went beyond, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, his death, his burial, his resurrection. And I remember many, many years ago where Ron, Pastor Ron Adama took a beating. He took a beating when he said, listen, the gospel is about the death, the burial, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And it's amazing back then. You say, oh, hey, I know that. But back then, 15, 20 years ago, we took a beating in the doctrinal movement and from friends who said, oh, no, it's got to be more than that. That's too easy. Well, here it is, death, burial, and resurrection. So if you, have, if you think you've been saved by any other means, you're not really saved. So why don't you lay your foundation today and that's believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. So Paul says, according to, there's a standard here. So he says, according to the standard, what is the standard? He says, according to the grace of God. Now, what is grace? God is gra grace is God's provision. And when it says, according to the grace of God, it actually indicates that God is the source of grace. We'll talk about that. Which grace was given to me? How did Paul? How did Paul receive grace for the first time? Well, when you get when you get beyond common grace, efficacious grace, and that's what Paul Paul said he's been he's been given he's been given grace, which is God's standard for living. He said that grace was given to me like a so there it is. Now Paul has his grace, and it means he's saved. And he also knows now that he has a communication gift. And so he says, like a wise master builder. Now, interestingly enough, we're going to talk about that word master builder here in just a moment. But that means Paul was a chief contractor. There's going to be a building built. There's going to be a spiritual building built. And he's the one that's leading this, this construction. So he says, I laid a foundation. And how did he lay a foundation? He's talking to Corinthians. He said, on one of these missionary journeys, he said, hey, I passed through this place. And when I did, he said, I went into the synagogue. I became Jesus. He said, I gave a clear gospel. He said, and guess what? Many of you became saved. He said, I laid the foundation. And that's evangelizing the lost in Corinth. Then there came a point in time when Paul moved on and moving down the timeline of human history, there came another person then by the name of Apollos, and Apollos ministry he came from Egypt. We'll talk about that in a minute. And he came, he came to Corinth, and he then he then built on Paul's foundation. So he says, another is building by teaching doctrine to the saved. And see, that's what's happened with you. 
many, none of you that I know of were saved under my ministry, perhaps, well, my own children, perhaps. Not saved under my ministry. So somebody evangelized you and laid the foundation. And then there came a point in time when you began to build on that foundation. The question is, what are you building? How are you building on that foundation? Because there is a specific way to build. And so Apollos was building then on Paul's foundation. And so what happened, somebody evangelized you, you became saved, and then somebody else came behind, behind that person, or uh, uh, yeah, be, behind that person, and began to teach you doctrine. See, somebody laid the foundation, and then somebody came on and built on that foundation. Right now, I'm building on a foundation that was laid in your life many, many years ago when you were saved. That was the foundation. He said, another is building on it, that foundation. He said, but now he turns his attention to you. He said, somebody laid the foundation in your life, evangelized you. Someone came along and taught you as you began to grow. He said, now concerning your growth, he said, but listen, he said, but each person, that's you, that's me, that's every person online. He said, you must be careful. Oh, really? You must be careful. Oh, careful out there now. He says, no, beware. Beware. That's a command. He said, beware. No, he's not screaming at you. He's not being unkind. What he's saying to you is, listen, look, take a look at your life. He said, you have this doctrine. You have been saved. You have all this doctrine. Now, what you need to do is be careful how you are using it. But each person must beware. How he, that's a believer, male or female, how he builds on that foundation. What kind of information are you taking in? And this is why when we look out here and see the 90% plus that don't even have the right foundation, they have another foundation, which is not another foundation at all. And whatever they're building on it, and so you find the person out there who has truly been saved, and they're going somewhere and stayed somewhere in a in a in a local assembly, maybe they've jumped around from assembly to assembly, looking for the truth, can't find it, and somebody is building on that foundation, and the issue is, what are you building on that foundation? I'd like to say to all of you here, that are under my ministry, that are under the ministry of Chaplain Steve Haynes, under the ministry of Sir Darrell Anderson, that are under the ministry of Pastor Ron Wynn, I would pray that what you are getting and what we are getting and what people are getting from us or them is building solid information on that, on that foundation. So the reason why you're here today is because you are being careful, not because it's me, but because the Holy Spirit is indicating to you this is the truth. And you're building on that foundation. But every believer must beware, beware, beware how you are building on that foundation. We're going to see the possibilities of what you're building. So he says, according to, we're going to exposit this. According to means according to the standard of. These two words, according to, indicate that Paul is going to state an absolute standard, not, a, not just a wishy-washy standard. And this is why when we talk about the word of God, it is a protocol plan. It's a plan that demands a precisely correct procedure. There is no slop in God's plan. There's no wishy-washiness. There's no maybes in God's plan. Oh, we may say maybe, but God didn't say maybe. He said, here it is, folks. He said there's an absolute standard by which something is to be accomplished. And according to the standard, what is that standard by which something's going to be accomplished? He said, according to the standard of the grace. Well, in context of this verse, we need to ask ourselves some questions about this phrase, according to the standard of the grace. Let's ask ourselves some questions. First of all, what is grace? I sort of chuckled to myself many years ago, and I'm not, not sure who was that said this, whether it was Bob Thiem or someone else, but when they were talking about grace, they said, look, grace is not a blue-eyed blonde. My grandmother's name was Grace, Grace Wilde. They're not talking about her. We're talking about some lady. What is grace then? Here it is. The answer is God. Grace is God's provision. And that's why when you take a look at this idea of grace and you're teaching the word of God categorically and you break down that word grace, 
The word grace appears in the Bible many, many times. But the question is, what kind of grace is it? What category of grace is it? Is he talking about common grace, efficacious grace, saving grace, logistical grace, alpha, logistical grace, bravo, super grace, ultra super grace? What's he talking about? This is where we have to categorize the word of God and understand what Paul is talking about. But what we know here is generically, the word grace means this is an absolute standard by which you're going to measure your Christian way of life. Are you living by grace? Are you applying by grace? We'll see what Paul's ministry was like concerning grace in just a moment. So the grace of God is actually an absolute standard by which we're going to measure everything we do. Is it God's provision or is it somebody else's provision? There's a second question here. The grace of God is an absolute standard of what? Oh, so yeah, the grace of God is an absolute standard. Well, hello, an absolute standard for what? Well, the grace of God is the absolute standard for everything pertaining to Christianity. There's nothing that there's nothing that relates to Christianity that doesn't pertain to grace. God's provision. So if we're living the Christian way of life by someone else's provision, what somebody else told us that doesn't match the word of God, we're out of bounds as far as God's plan is concerned. Oh, you may be saved. But see, this is the difference between applying the word of God from the sphere of the flesh or the sphere of the spirit, and that's going to be the issue. So in the second point, according to the standard of grace of God, and that word of God means that's a date of, that's a date of, of source, which means this standard of God's grace where did it come from? It comes from God. God is the ultimate source of all grace. <laughs> I can't take any any uh, uh, any merit for that. I can't take any kudos. No, no, I'm applying it. I'm learning it. I'm trying to, uh, no, I'm not trying. I'm either, I either am or I'm not. I'm applying God's grace. And that's the standard by which we're living. So when you take a look at your, your own Christian life and you see that you see in your life, whatever kind of pressure you have in your life, you have to ask yourself, is that doing something right? Or is it pressure because I'm doing something wrong? If you're doing it right, that's because you're applying God's grace provision. You're applying the standard for Christianity. But if you find out that you're not applying it, a standard for Christianity. Now you have your answer. You are applying to your life something that is outside of God's provision, which is grace. So Paul says, according to the standard of the grace of God, and that means that God is the source. We can't make any claim to, uh, to, to grace. Oh, we, we're appropriating it. But oh my, let's see, this, uh, excuse me, uh, Billy Bob out there, I see you're doing this and such. Hey, isn't that wonderful? I came up with that plan. No, 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 no. No, I don't come up with God's plan. I don't come up with a plan to substitute for God's plan. No, God is, uh, God's grace is the only thing upon which you and I have absolutely no claim. But what is it? Grace is a divine monopoly. It belongs to him. A monopoly means there's one person out here that owns something. God owns it all. Grace is a divine monopoly as well as the standard what is right and what is wrong. You take a look at your own life. Are things going right or things going wrong? Well, if they're going right, it's because you're using God's grace provision, his word, whatever it is. If something's going wrong in your life, it's because you need to look and see you're applying the wrong Provision. Provision coming from someone else. Maybe it's something you dreamed up. See, the Christian way of life is not a game. It's tough. It's hard. It's difficult. There's a war between the flesh and the spirit. Question is, who's winning? Is the spirit winning or is the flesh winning? Well, you have to answer that question. Thirdly, Human beings can appropriate grace, but grace belongs exclusively to God. It's God owns it. He, he allows us, he allows us to, uh, to, uh, to appropriate that grace. It's there. It's in the bank. It's in the spiritual bank. 
Now, just as just as easy as you go to the uh, to the bank and you make a withdrawal from your account, God's uh, God's uh, God's spiritual bank is inside the Word of God. So you go to the spiritual bank, you open up, find out what His provision is, and you appropriate it. What that means, you you learn it, you believe it, you put it on the on the launching pad. Circumstance comes along, and you apply it. So appropriating the grace is actually coming to Bible class, learning the truth, believing it, and placing it on the on the platform to be launched into the circumstances of life. You appropriate the Word of God, you appropriate grace by coming to Bible class. That's what you're doing. So grace is, in fact, a divine monopoly, a divine monopoly. Belongs to God, as well as the criterion. Grace is the criterion or the standard for determining the right and wrong, for determining the right and wrong of things. Okay, is this right? Is it wrong? If it's right, it's because you're applying the truth. If it's wrong, it's because you're applying something else other than the truth. God's word and God's grace is the standard by which we measure everything in the Christian way of life. Now, Paul says, according to the standard of the grace of God, which was given to me. Grammatically, that phrase, which was given to me, what does that mean? just opening the word of God and just reading the scripture. When you're reading the scripture, we need to know what does it mean? What is it saying? What does it mean to me? Well, that phrase, which was given to me, actually grammatically was given is a verb phrase. And it refers to the point of time when Paul was saved. According to the grace of God, the standard of the grace of God, which was given to me. Well, when did Paul receive this standard of grace? When did he receive that? It was at salvation. He received saving grace. He'd already he'd already had common grace, where he was able to know, hey, there's a God out there. He actually believed there was a God out there. When he heard the gospel, he believed the gospel, and he, he appropriated saving grace. So Paul says, according to the standard of grace which was given to me. He was saved in the right way. He believed in the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. And in point two, what was given indicates that Paul received salvation apart from any human merit. See, what that means is God's grace is his plan. Jesus Christ is the one that did the work. And when we get this thing, get this idea that I have to do some work to, stay, to get saved, or I have to work to stay saved, we are outside of God's plan because what that means, God, you're going to save me because of what I did. Not what I believe, but what I did. I'm believing, Father, in the one who did the work. It's ama isn't it amazing that that is so hard for many people to believe and to accept? Yeah. Jesus did all the work. All we have to do is believe. And believe is something you do, but God doesn't consider that as work. He said, that is, that is my plan for you to be saved, and that is apart from human merit. The merit is in Christ, not in you and me. So Paul believed. He did not try to work for his salvation. Now, to me, he said, this, this, was, this grace was given to me indicates that it was Paul's advantage. Here again is one of those data of advantages. Grammatically, you don't see this unless you understand the, the grammar of the phrase to me. And when he says it was given to me, that means it was to Paul's advantage to be the recipient of that grace. Isn't it amazing that is, it was to Paul's advantage to receive that grace provision of Christ on the cross it was to his advantage because when he believed in Jesus, guess what he did? He received everlasting life, eternal life, life without condemnation at the end of life. So here's some contemporary application. We don't need to leave this with Paul. You see, it is to the advantage of every human being, you, me, I, we, us. It's to, to the advantage of every human being to be the recipient of saving grace. Jesus died for the entire human race. You, I, we believe we are the recipient of saving grace, and it is to our advantage to do that. Why? The advantage is not going to hell and the lake of fire. The advantage is we're going to spend eternity with God in the afterlife. 
You see, it's the advantage of every born again Christian to be the recipient of logistical grace. See, watch this. Contemporary application. It is to the advantage of every human being, those people who are lost, to be the recipient of saving grace. Yes, it is. It is also to the advantage of every born again believer. Now you are in phase two. See, you receive grace, this grace, saving grace. But now that you're in phase two because you're saved, God has another provision for you that is called logistical grace. And that means that he has made every provision without a doubt. There's nothing missing. The only thing missing is our understanding of what God has provided. But it's to your advantage, it's to my advantage, and to the reborn again Christian to be the recipient of logistical grace. And the logistical grace is like going to the front line of battle. You've got your you've got your armor, you have your weapons, you've got your you've got your ammunition. <laughs> then you look up and oh my goodness, I've only got one bullet left. Bingo, you fire that bullet, you are out of bullets, you're out of ammunition, but hold it, no big deal. The military has provided someone, here they come, and they come and they bring you from the from ranks behind the front line, they bring you more supplies so that you can continue the battle. That is logistical grace. That's logistical supply. So once you get saved, that's not the end. You, you don't have to fight this battle by yourself. God has provided everything you and I need. It's already in the spiritual bank. That's logistical grace. You simply go and you claim what God has in the bank. That's the, that's the word of God. That's coming to Bible class. So it's to your advantage and my advantage after we become born again Christians to be the recipient of logistical grace on the way to spiritual adulthood. Now let's take a look at Paul's Christian life. Paul indicates to us that he was the, he was the, the recipient of grace. And so everything that Paul did every bit of his service had to be based on grace if paul's production in other words the outworking what did paul do look at all that paul did in his life in his christian life look at all the things that he did that were wonderful helpful advantageous to every to every person he came in contact with we see paul's production everything he did he was based on grace it was, a, it was God's provision from the time he was saved, taking in the word of God, going out and uh, serving as an ambassador, looking to God as a priest. Everything that Paul did was based on grace, God's provision. As he prepared for his ministry, everything he did was based on grace. It was God's provision. You don't go there. You go here. This is where I want you. This is what you say, not what you think you want to say. This is what you say. Everything that Paul did in his preparation was based on grace. Paul's entire ministry was based on grace. Your preparation for the utilization of your, your spiritual gift should be based on grace. You received that spiritual gift, whatever it is. You received that, that gift by grace. You didn't earn it. You didn't deserve it. But he, God gave it to you. There it is. Now you prepare to use that gift. Many, many of the spiritual gifts of the 10 gifts that are still extant today, requ they require some preparation. Can you imagine? Oh, I not only can imagine, I did this. I was teaching the Bible shortly after I got saved with no knowledge of the Bible. I was reading, I was reading a manuscript. I was reading a, reading a book trying to explain the wonderful Christian way of life into which we had we had entered. Preparation based on grace, ministries based on grace. That's Paul's life. Production, preparation, ministry. Everything about his life was based on grace. Same for you. Paul says, according to the standard of the grace of God, which was given to me. Now, okay, now he says, okay, I've got this grace. I'm saved now. Oh, by the way, I, I see I have the gift of apostle. So what am I going to do? I'm going to, I'm going to prepare. I'm going to, I'm going to learn the word of God. I'm going to take the revelation that God has given me out of, out of the Arabian desert. 
for three years. I'm going to take all that. Anything else that God tells me along the way, I'm going to believe that. And as a wise master builder, see, Paul's going to construct something here, spiritual construction. So that phrase, like a wise master builder, grammatically, what does that mean? Well, interesting enough, the Greek word for master builder, there's two words there, master builder. See, sometimes you see them put together. But master builder, two words there. The word is architectone. So look at that, look at that word. I rather imagine you can look at that word and you know what that word means, even if you saw it in the Greek. There it is. We, we've, trans, we've transliterated it, architecton. We see in the English, an architect is someone who designs a building, designs the building. Bob Bonds, his brother-in-law, Bill Malone, they designed the Bible Doctrine Church of Little Rock on Stagecoach Road. Bill was an architect. Bob was the man who was the chief contractor. Paul was not an architect. He was not designing the plan. That was God's problem. But what Paul did, he's going to be, he's going to take the plan and he's going to build something. So he is the chief contractor, the head of the builders. So he says, I, he, what's he, he says here, like a wise master builder, he knows he's got the gift of apostle. He knows he's got the communicate a communication gift. Now he's going to go out and communicate it. So in the English, an architect we see is one who designs the building. But Paul is the, the contractor, the head of the builders. So Paul is the chief contractor as far as the Corinthians assembly, as far as the Corinthians assembly is concerned. Paul goes in there, there's nothing but unbelievers there. He evangelizes. Boy, there's a there's a group of believers now. He's going to start to build on that foundation in their life, giving them the word of God. He's constructing a building on top of that foundation. And Paul is the person who evangelized the lost at, at Corinth, resulting in an assembly of believers in Corinth. Paul wasn't building a building. No, that, that's a mistake. When I look back now, I say, good gracious sakes alive. What we did, we had a wonderful, wonderful building. It was perfect. And in the 35 years that we were in that building, I think that's how long we were in it, for 35 years, there was never a day when I said to myself, oh, my goodness, I wish we'd have done it this way. 35 years. That thing was so well designed. It was so well put together. And when I look down this list now and I see those of you online and realize the part that you played in building that building. That was a that was a brick and mortar building. Paul's building a spiritual assembly, evangelizing lost. See they see they get saved, bringing them together to teach the word of God so that they can begin to, begin to grow in grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, so that they will have impact in the Corinthian era. era. The only problem is after Paul left, it went downhill. So Paul said, I laid, the, I laid the foundation. In other words, what he's saying is I went into Corinth. I was on a missionary journey. I went into Corinth. And Paul's activities in Corinth, what did he do? First of all, Paul evangelized. And guess what? Before long, Paul had some converts. What are you going to do now? Just leave them, I guess. See, this is the problem. This is the problem of many denominations today. But I believe that we had this thing right. When we went, when I went, to, when I went into South Korea, what we were going, we were evangelizing, evangelizing the lost. Yes, evangelize the lost. Some people got saved, but we leave, and there is no pastor teacher to take them on. That assembly goes, it just goes flat. The same thing was happening in the Philippines in 1985. We went to Cataluna Pequeno with with, uh, uh, with Carly, Pastor Carly Tudadula. Yesterday was his birthday. I sent him a birthday greeting. I love the man. I love his family. Wonderful family. But looking back, we finally realized, oh, wait a minute, Carly, go. 
we don't just come in and evangelize. You have no pastor teacher for here. And we learned that the 85 churches in 1985, of the 85 churches that started, the church that I began started in Catalonia, Virginia, is the only church that survived that. Now, Sir Darrell's over there. He's training pastor teachers. He's not pastoring a church. Sir Darrell's not pastoring a church. We learned that what you do is you teach, what you do is you train pastors, and guess what? You multiply, you multiply your results. So after Paul, after Paul evangelized, what did he do? He began to teach the word of God to these new believers. And what was he doing? He was oriented, he was or they had orientation to doctrine. They, he was orienting these people to the doctrines of the word of God, which is mandatory for new believers. See that word mandatory there? That's not wishy-washy. That means you can't live the word of God. You can't live the Christian way of life if you don't know the word of God. Well, I know the word of God. I've read the Bible through three times. What's it say? What's it mean? I don't know. This is why we need pastor teachers. Not me. We need a pastor teacher. Might be me. But doesn't necessarily have to be me. But every born again Christian, and you know that, that's why you're here today. That's why you are with me on Facebook today, whoever you are. You're with me today. And the reason you're here is because you know that I'm teaching the word of God. You know that the word that I've taught is beneficial to your life. So Paul was orienting these new these new believers to doctrine. Doctrine. The intake of doctrine must be based upon regeneration. What does that mean? <laughs> if you go to Bible, and listen, this is exactly what's happening to many people today. I've indicated to you that 90% plus, I, I need to rework that. Uh, that uh, I, I think it may even be worse than that now. But several years ago, it was my conclusion that the that 90% plus, that's somewhere between 90 and 91, 90% plus of those who are Christians weren't even saved. Now, can you imagine those people in, in quote unquote church every Sunday in Sunday school class in, in the church service, the body assembled, and likely that the pastor in the pulpit is doesn't even have the pa gift of pastor teacher. That's not uncommon, folks, to have somebody in the pulpit that doesn't have the gift of pastor teacher. So Paul's secondary activity, second activity then, is to teach the word of God, to orient them to doctrine, and the intake of doctrine has to be based upon regeneration. Without being saved, whatever you're taking in is worthless. So when Paul departed Corinth, here's what happened. Paul comes into town. He evangelizes. People get saved. He starts to teach them. They had this assembly of believers now in Corinth. Paul leaves. Before he left, he appointed some, some people there. But later, Apollos came into Corinth. And when he came to, when he came to Corinth, the question we, we might ask here is, well, if, Cor if Apollos came to Corinth after Paul was there and left, who is this Apollos? Listen to this. This is historical information. Apollos was an evangelist, an apologist, a leader, a friend of the Apostle Paul. Now, it didn't start out that way. Apollos actually was a Jew. Listen to me. He was a Jew from. Well, wait a minute. How did he get down there? Remember all the dispersions? The Jews were driven out of their land. Where do they go? They went east. They went north. They went south. They went west. Some went nearby. Some went far away. While Apollos actually was in Alexandria, Egypt. And he was described as some in scripture. He was described as eloquent. Mighty in the scriptures. These are quotes from the scripture. He was fervent in the spirit and instructed in the way of the Lord. Now, you see this? I'm, I'm going to ask you, I'm going to ask you uh, later, if you, if you have these notes, when, you're, when you have them up on the screen, 
if I were to if I were to if I were to take that uh, verse and I open that link there, it would actually take us to the verse. That link is actually open there. But the scripture is very clear about Apollos. Fervent in spirit, mighty in scriptures, eloquent, instructed in the way of the Lord. But the truth of the matter was, he was only a born again Jew, which made him a messianic Jew, just like Paul when he got saved on the road to Damascus. So in 54 AD, Apollos traveled to Ephesus, where he boldly taught in the synagogue. He wasn't he wasn't teaching in the assembly of believers. He was teaching in the synagogue. Remember, he is a Jew. He was raised in the Jewish synagogue. He was he was raised in the Jewish tradition. Just so happens he's not an Egyptian. He's just a a um, a, a Jew that was scattered as a re, as a result of some of the, the dispersions. Understood scripture. He became a believer of Jesus Christ from the scriptures. He's a Messianic Jew. He's teaching in the synagogue. However, when he came to Apoll uh, when he came to Ephesus at that time, Apollos's understanding of the gospel was incomplete. Why was it incomplete? Since he was acquainted only with the baptism of John, as John the Baptist. That's Acts eighteen twenty five. He was acquainted only with the baptism of John. Well, what was that? This means that Apollos preached repentance and faith in the Messiah. Apollos believed in Jesus of Nazareth. He believed that Jesus was the Messiah, but he did not know the full magnitude of Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. He's back in, he's like living in the Old Testament times. When you're going, when you're going to you're going to the temple, you go to the synagogue, you hear all these the rituals and everything that they're doing, all their uh, their rituals and their their sacrifices. He knew all that. But there came a point in time in his life when he believed that, that all that information was pointing to Jesus of Nazareth, who was the Messiah of Israel. At that point in time, he's looking for the kingdom to be established. Ooh, the, the Messiah is here. But he had no understanding of the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. It'd be like living up to that, uh, to that point and going off somewhere and then never hearing about what took place before you left. However, Aquila and Priscilla, friends of Paul, spent some time with Apollos in Ephesus and filled in the gaps of his understanding about Jesus Christ, Acts, Acts 18, 26. And Apollos was now equipped with a complete message. Oh, he's got the whole thing down, got it all nailed down now, just like Paul. And so what did he do? He immediately began a preaching ministry and was used of God as an effective apologist for the for the gospel, Paul is not, he's not apologizing. He's explaining it. He's got it right now. So what did he do? Apollos traveled through Acacia, a, a general location. He traveled through Acacia. Eventually, found his way to Corinth. Now he's in Corinth in Acts 19, 1. And what did he do? He watered where Paul had sown. See, Paul was Paul was the uh, he was the uh, he, he was the evangelizer. He laid the foundation. The foundation is Jesus Christ. Faith alone and Christ alone saves you eternally. Paul laid that foundation. Then he took that group in Corinth and he began to teach them. Then Paul leaves. Later, here comes Apollos. So Apollos traveled through Acacia and eventually he found his way to Corinth where he watered. That means he took the foundation that Paul, these people are saved. Paul sowed the seed. Boy, it, it blossomed. There it is. They're saved. Now let's pour some water on this. Why do you why do you water a seed? You water the seed for it to grow. And what this means is then that uh, Apollos was teaching the word of God as Paul understood it. He was doing exactly what Paul was doing. And in point number 10, this is important to remember when studying Paul's first letter to the Corinthians. Why is it why is it important to understand this letter that I'm speaking from right now? So when Paul uh, Apollos came in, he's watering the seed. He's watering the foundation there so that they can grow. And when you realize he was coming to teach the word of God, to bring them to spiritual growth, it's important to remember when studying Paul's first letter to the Corinthians. Why? Because of his natural abilities. Listen to me. 
because of, of Apollos' natural abilities. And this is what we want to get out of this passage this morning, out of this section, out of verse 10. Because of, because of his natural abilities. I mean, this guy had it together. He was something else. You pick some movie star. You pick some. You pick some individual out here. I was watching a movie last night, and one of the one of the men, the man, the main character in this thing, was a was a kind or another, and everywhere he went, he had to run from the people who wanted to. The paparazzi wanting to take pictures and wanting a, and wanting a uh, an autograph. Oh my goodness! This guy's it, it, people were flocking to Apollos because of his natural abilities. Apollos had attracted a following among the believers in Corinth. So now, what Paul is telling you? Oh, excuse me. Now uh, we got this nice congregation here in uh, in um, uh, Corinth. And uh, just a second, I'm going to have to change the tape here now. This is for, for William. Just a moment. Okay. Because of his natural abilities, you've got this group of people now that are believers in uh, in Corinth. And listen, I've seen this. I've seen this. I don't know how many times. Where a church, a local assembly, I'm going to call it a church. You understand what I'm talking about. A denominational entity out here. This, this local church is without a pastor. So you appoint a pulpit committee. And you go out and you start looking. Well, let's see. What are we looking for? Oh, let's, we want some guy that you know he's a like some guy that knows how to cut the grass. We know we want some guy that's a mechanic. We want some guy. Wait a minute. It's a pastor teacher. I know, but we. I don't like the way this guy dresses. I don't like the way he combs his hair. Have you seen this guy? He's got too many children. You see this guy? He wants too much money. So there's. This idea of bantering back and forth. Listen, this is what happened in the congregation at Corinth. You've got this group of people. Paul evangelizes. They get saved. Paul is teaching them the word of God. They, oh, they're growing. They've got this nice assembly there. But, uh-oh, they don't have a pastor. Apollos comes into town. And, whoo, look at this. He is like a movie star. Every, not everybody. Many people flock to him out of that congregation. So what do we have? We have a split in the congregation. Because of his natural abilities, Apollos had attracted a following among the believers in Corinth. See, several people moved to him. Listen to me now, point 12. However, you've got this group of people now that have flocked over here to, to Apollos. You've got this other group over here, don't have anything at this point in time. And what we need to realize is, oh, they admire Apollos so much. Oh, we, we, we admire Jim Bertel so much. Oh, we admire Dr. W.O. Vaught. Oh, we admire Bob Thiem. Oh, see, if, if, I were, <laughs> if, uh, if many people had a choice between me and Bob Thiem, it, listen, it's no challenge at all. No, they wouldn't choose me. If you're going to choose between, uh, let's see, um, W.A. Criswell and um, somebody else, oh no, we want no, we want uh, we want Dr. Criswell. You see, because of his natural abilities, he attracted many people from Corinth. However, you need to understand this. Listen, this is the point. Admiration for Apollos created a split in the Corinthian assembly. And against Apollos' wishes, listen, this guy had it together. When he saw that this had that he he had created a split in the Corinthian assembly, Paul wished that there was a, listen, his what were his wishes? 
that split was against his wishes. He didn't want that. There was a faction in the Corinth church, Corinthian church, that claimed him as their spiritual ment mentor to the exclusion of the apostle Paul. You hear that? Oh, no, no, no. We don't want to listen to Paul anymore. No, we got this guy. No, I want Paul's message. I want Paul's message. So this group wants Apollos. This group wants, and guess what? The, the, the assembly is now split. But it was against Apollos' wishes. He did not want that. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 12 through 13, Paul deals with this uh, partisanship. This is why, listen, this same thing happens in the political arena. It's called identity politics. I want this person because it's a male. I want this person because he's not a Christian. I want this person because it's, she's, a, she's a woman. I want this person because they're black. I want this person because, eh, what is it? It's no longer a part of the truth. What is the truth? What is the, what is the true meaning of the Constitution? What is the true meaning of the Bible? Well, I don't care what it is. I like that guy. I like that girl. I like that person over there. To the exclusion of the truth. So Paul dealt with that partisanship in 1 Corinthians 1, verses 12 through 13. You see, the truth of the matter is this. Christ is not divided. Christ isn't divided. And neither should we. We shouldn't be divided. Hmm. Here's the principle. As a born-again Christian, we cannot love personality over <laughs> Do I dare do I dare mention something that probably is Ears right now, as a born as born again Christian, we cannot love personality over truth. Oh, I don't care what the truth is. I like that guy. Oh, he's so sweet. He visits me all the time. He comes to my home. He invites us out for a meal. What's he doing, Doctor? No, I don't want Doctor. No, I I I choose his personality over truth. Remember, not too long ago. Then in a presidential campaign, one of the one of the candidates they choose facts over truth. What? I think that's the way it was said. We see Apollos ministered in Corinth for some time. Yeah, he stayed there for quite a while. Then he departed elsewhere. But after Apollos departed Corinth, the church entered a great state of disorganization and carnality, and Paul had to deal with that. This was the most carnal, carnal local assembly on the planet. You see, biblical, the biblical fact, how a local assembly advances spiritually. So we're not talking about, we're not, as they go down the list, I'm not talking about Bob or Will. Danny or Carolyn, no, or Daryl, go down the list. How a local assembly spirit, uh, advances depends upon something. We're going to take a look at that. So we're not talking about Bob and Wilma advancing. Not talking about Leanne. Not talking about Brian. Not talking about Michelle and Stan. Not talking about Richard and Nita or Pastor Ron or Roger, Janet, Daryl. Not talking about individuals. The question, we're looking at the local assembly. That would be you us, we, assembled here on WebEx and Facebook, how are you going to advance? How is this assembly going to advance? Well, the question is this, or the statement is this, how a local assembly advances spiritually depends upon its pastor and upon the, per and upon the um, let, let me back up and say this again. How a local assembly advances spiritually depends upon its pastor and upon the personal relationship of the general congregation to the Holy Spirit and to doctrine. It depends upon the pastor. How, how are you going to advance spiritually if you have a man like me 
assuming that I'm not teaching anything. Oh, you just, oh, you just, you like me because I came from Ohio. OH10. Oh, you like me because I was in the Navy. Oh, you like me because I went to Southwestern Seminary. Oh, you like me because I came and moved to Arkansas. No, 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 no. The question is, am I teaching truth? Is your, is your previous pastor, is your future pastor going to teach you truth? So how a local assembly advances, and this is why, this is why in Pateno, many years ago, that, that locally has continued. Now, as a result of Sir Darrell's ministry there, and my initial ministry, we have other assemblies over there that are strong based on the word of God, based on pastor teachers teaching the word of God. Sir Darrell's done a great job when, over there. One day he may be able to go back if they'll ever let him in again, but that'll be his decision. But there are other assemblies are strong because we got the picture we knew what to do you don't evangelize and then become the pastor you evangelize get a group of people and train pastors so how a local assembly advances spiritually depends upon its pastor is he teaching or is he not upon the personal relationship of the general congregation to the holy spirit are you living your life in the sphere of the spirit or in the sphere of the flesh and are you taking in sound doctrine are you coming to bible class See, those are questions. So Paul says, I laid a foundation, another, that's the next word. Paul said, I laid the foundation, then another. And interesting enough, that word another in the Greek, in the Greek language, there are two words for another. One is another of the same kind, that's alas. And there's another word, a, of a, another of a different kind, and that means heteros. So when you're looking at when you're looking at this, and Paul said, "Hey, I came in and I laid the foundation." Then somebody else came in after me, and it was another of the same kind. The word that word a loss there is, a, and I'm yeah, sorry. The word for another is a loss, and that means another of the same kind, which means this was Paul teaching sound doctrine, and Apollos came in right behind him, and just in the same manner that Paul taught, Apollos is teaching too. So it is just not another of a different kind. There are many pastors out, many, many local assemblies out here who have pastors of a different kind. If they were listening to Paul or they're listening to a sound doctrinal teacher and somebody else came in behind them and was teaching the same message, that's a loss. But if somebody comes in and changes the message, that's heteros. This is a loss. And that means another of the same kind here Another is another of the same kind, and it's a reference to the fact that Apollos became the pastor after Paul and taught exactly the same kind of information. So Paul says, I laid a foundation. Another is building on it. That's Apollos. This means that Apollos came in behind Paul, and he's teaching and following the sin that Paul laid down. Then we get this information. But let every man, uh-oh, but let every man, now we're talking to you, me, us, we, Facebook. Who's on Facebook? Who's on here with me? We're just going to go down the list and start with Bob up here at the top. Start with me up at the top. We go down to, Pat, to Pastor Ron on the bottom. Speaking to each one of us individually. Let every man take heed how he build if they're on. You have the foundation. You are already saved. You've laid that foundation. You believed in Jesus Christ. Now the question is, what are you doing on that foundation? Here it is. This sentence, but let every man take heed how he build it thereon. This sentence explains what went wrong at Corinth. What went wrong at Corinth? What went wrong in Galatians, in Galatian assembly? So this wasn't just, it didn't go wrong just in one place. It went wrong in Corinth. It went wrong at Galatia. It went wrong at Laodicea. And what, what went wrong in many of the assemblies of the ancient world that became apostate? What in the world happened? And this sentence speaks to that. But let every man take heed how he buildeth thereon. You see, Paul is going to be, be very clear. <laughs> there are not many times when Paul isn't clear. 
Paul is going to be very clear. I think this is why when I teach, that's what I want. I want clarity. Are you understanding what I'm saying? Do you understand what I mean? Do you understand my passion? Do you understand my concern, my love for you? Paul is going to be very clear with this statement. The general character of a local church, listen to me, the, the, the general character of a local church, listen to me now, is determined by the people in the local assembly, not the leadership. Paul's going to be very clear. The general character of a local church, of a local assembly. So if if somebody looked at the, came in and said, "Oh, look at that! Uh, where are you? What do you? Where do you pastor, Pastor Jim?" But I pastor the Christian Way of Life Church. Someone said, "Send to me yesterday." Is that located in North Little Rock? I said, "No, ma'am. No, it's not." I said, "It's a virtual church, a virtual assembly." So if someone came and looked at those of you on on uh, WebEx and let's put all bring all the people over and put them on from Facebook. Let's take us here on WebEx. Let's go over to Facebook. Look at that entire group. Sometimes it run, range, ranges about 50 people. Okay, put them together. It's about 50 people. When you take a look at that, that's the local assembly. Now, the question is, what is the character of that local assembly? Well, the truth of the matter is, is the general character of this local assembly is not determined by me. It's determined by you. The local church, the character is determined by the people in the local church, not the leadership. So we have a contrast that's being established here. A contrast is established between the communicators in the Corinthian assembly, that's Paul and Apollos, who did their job faithfully. They did it faithfully. See, this is why when you take a look at this and you say, uh-uh, hold it now. What is the character of the local church? What we see is that Paul and Paul and Apollos were doing their job faithfully. So if I am doing my job faithfully, then the character of the assembly of the Christian way of life church, or Christian way of life church, is not dependent upon me. It's dependent upon you. So that when people take a look at the group of people that are online with me on Facebook and WebEx and say, ah, uh, let's see, let's take a look. What I uh, wonder how that local assembly is characterized. And they begin to look at your life. They begin to look at what you think, what you feel, what you speak, what you say, what you do. Wow. That just looks like Jesus. The character of the of the of the of the local assembly. Oh man, I'll tell you what, I don't want to go, I don't want to be a part of that. Those people don't do anything more than what I'm doing. I'm as far out in left field. And listen, I don't see any difference in them. See, the character of the local assembly is determined by the people who make up that congregation. And the individual members of the congregation in Corinth, they did not accept teaching not accept doctrine and guess what it fell apart spiritually in the various types of carnality then we have the conjunction of contrast the word but and this sets up a contrast between the faithfulness of its pastors paulus and and, uh, and paul and the failure of the believers in corinth assembly so paul says look here he said but each person Right down the list, Bob, Wilma, Leanne, Brian, all the way down, Jim, and then go over to Facebook, Joe, and whoever else is out there. But each person must be careful. See, each person refers to individuals. That's just one at a time. Each person must be careful. No, the Greek word here means beware. Beware. Each person must beware. In fact, it's a command, as I'd indicated earlier. When you hear biblical truth, when you hear Bible doctrine, the principles, the promises, the doctrines, the techniques, the rules for living, when you hear Bible doctrine being taught, you need to be aware of what you do with it. Now, I don't mean by that. that way. You, need to, you need to be aware of what you do with it. Well, not meaning to castigate anybody, 
The question is, you need to be, the idea is, you need to be aware. You need to be aware of what you do with it, whoever you are. People who are going to local assemblies, wherever they are. There, there are many assemblies across the United States that are teaching sound doctrine. But the people who are going there, do they really understand what they're getting? They need to be aware of what they're doing with what they're listening. So the question is this, what can you do with Bible doctrine that you hear? You're here today, you're hearing it. What can you do with it? You've got some friends going to another assembly. How about those that are with Steve, Steve Ellis? How about those that are with Mark Goad? How about those that are with Brad West? How about those that are with Carlito Dula? How about those that are with uh, S uh, Nestor Sahara? How about those that are with somebody else? Wherever they happen to be, what can you do with Bible doctrine that you hear? Here's what you can do, several things. First of all, you can ignore it. Many people are ignoring the truth. They come, why they come to Bible class, I don't know. But they're ignoring the truth. What else can you do? You can hear it now and hear it again later. The writer of the Hebrew said, oh, he said, sometimes, sometimes after you hear this truth, Guess what? You have to hear it again and again and again and again. And someone says, man, get off of that thing. I've heard this a hundred times. What about this person over here not getting it? Not getting it. So you can hear it now and hear it again. Some people hear it once, but need to hear it again because they forget it. I've done that. Here's another thing. You can learn it, but not apply it. Many people are doing that. In other words, what you learn becomes a matter of ego. You learn doctrine. Woohoo! Boy, look at all this doctrine I've got. You learn doctrine so that you know more than anyone else, and you say to yourself, mm hmm, yeah, I'm okay. Why am I okay? Because I'm better than that person. And listen, you always pick out someone who's doing far worse than you are. So when you compare yourself to that person, say, oh, I got all this doctrine, and wow, I guess I must be okay. A fourth thing you can do, you can learn doctrine and apply it. How about that? You can ignore it, you can hear it and hear it again. You can learn it and not apply it. But the best thing is to learn doctrine and apply it. This is the ideal reason for learning the word of God. So Paul's warning to us, and he's warning believers, Paul's warning to us as believers to be sure is to be sure that we metabolize doctrine, hold it now, don't stop, don't stop there. That we metabolize doctrine, we remember it, we learn it, and we apply it. You see, we're to orient our life. Orient. Yes, orient. We are to orient our life to God's plan for our life by means of doctrine. How do you orient your life to God? The way you do it is through doctrine. And that's why I'm so grateful for you who are online with me today. Facebook, YouTube, WebEx, however. We're to orient the, our life to God's plan for our... Let me, just, let me say this again. We're to orient our life to God's plan for our life by means of doctrine. We are to make doctrine the basis of orientation of life. How are we going to orient the life? See, without doctrine, we're out there just floundering around in life. But I want us to remember that we are soldiers for Christ in the angelic conflict. Yes, we are. And Paul, Paul then says, but each person must be aware how he builds on it. What are we talking about? The word how here brings up two issues. How he builds on it. How you build on that foundation. You must be aware how you build on it. So that word how, three letters, brings up two issues. The first issue is the intake of doctrine. That's what you're doing. Second issue, the output of production. So once you take it in, it needs to be it needs to be, be outputted, if you can put it that way. It needs to have output of production. You take in the word of God and you apply it to produce something out there. You see, doctrine is the spiritual energy that motivates production. Why are you doing what you're doing? It's because I have this doctrine that says this is the plan, this is what I'm to do. And the sad part about this today is many are going to the work, going, they're going to the local assembly, they're going to quote unquote church, but when they're going there, they're not getting anything or what they're getting is wrong. I mean, you look at the production, nothing is happening. 
So doctrine is spiritual energy. What you're going to do, it's going to motivate your production. This is why I'm doing this. The word of God says so. So the great issue regarding production, the output of your Christian life, your Christian service, is whether the production comes from the sphere of the spirit or whether it's coming from the sphere of the flesh. We're out of time. I got this last phrase here. Paul says, how he, the born again Christian, male or female, how he builds on it, builds on the foundation. See, by analogy, the superstructure of a building in verse 10 will now be amplified by Paul in verses 11 through 16. We don't want to miss this. Right now, we're on page seven. And I think we've got 10, 10, 11, 11 pages, 12 pages. Okay. Um, and since I, it's not, it's not a matter of having to take time to study, it's already here. It's just a matter of output. And it's what I was talking about, the possibility of doing something during the week. Uh, I'll let you know early uh, whether I'll do this tomorrow night or not. If uh, not, it'll be on Wednesday. But because it, it, this is so important to our lives, I'd like to do it today, or do it tomorrow, rather. So let's take a look at that, and I'll get in touch with you. Let's pray. Father, we thank you this, uh, this morning for uh, this instruction in 1 Corinthians 3, 10 through 15. Our, our uh, congregation, our assembly is not like that out there in, in, uh, in Corinth at this point in time. I don't know if it's ever been that way. Oh, we have some come and some go. But listen, the, the attitude, the spirit of uh, the local assembly here, local around a, uh, a computer, the virtual, the virtual assembly. I think we're together. We're together on what we're doing. It's because we're oriented to the truth. We're oriented to doctrine. We're making sure that we're building on the foundation. We're building something solid on the foundation. And when we get to verse 11, 12, 13, 14, and 15, this is where, again, goodness gracious, we see how it is that things can go wrong so fast. I want our, our Father, I want our people uh, that are with us today, I want them to be satisfied, happy, rejoicing in whatever the circumstances we face. We'll face them individually. Oh, we can face them corporately. We're all we're all under a lot of pressure with weather right now. We're under pressure with the lockdowns. That's all the same. But we may have circumstances in our individual lives that we also have to handle. The only way that's handled is through your word. If there's going to be any semblance of peace and rejoicing and happiness, that's what we want, Father. But you've already made you've you've already made the provision. It's a matter of us appropriating it now. Father, bless every person that's online with us today. Continue to, continue to be gracious toward us for the circumstances of life. We'll praise you for it in Christ's name. Amen. God bless you, folks. We'll pick up with verse 11, either tomorrow night or Wednesday. I'll get back with you, very, I'll get back with you quickly to let you know which, which it's going to be. God bless all of you, and good day.